would agree with him if at all as we speak right now uh, Kindiki and uh, the former CS for agriculture would be in court for bringing us fake fertilizer and uh, the, the CS interior for the brutal brutality that happened to the young people during demonstrations. If we would start accountability from that side, then maybe I would look at it like a very uh, fair ground. But you don't tell me you allow somebody who uh, supervised the, 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 the abductions, somebody who supervised the forced disappearances, somebody who supervised all these breach of, cost of our constitution, sit pretty in every other place and him being declared in Yahururu by some MPs as somebody who is supposed to come in as a kingpin, yet you want to tell us that we need to first kick Gashagwa outside because he's the problem of this nation. The problem of this nation starts with the head himself, the president himself, the people that he wants to work around, and the people he wants to, uh, to shield from uh, facing... Uh, justice because if, if at all it's about accountability we should be seeing the cs for education being grilled why have you changed the university model why are we seeing the newspaper writing that uh, there is a crisis that is threatening our national examination for the principals to tell us that if things are not handled in the next three weeks we might look at 2.2 million candidates not sitting for the examination and somebody wants to tell us that an impeachment of the deputy president is a is a priority it gives me worry as a kenyan person i'm also again worried that for the first time ever since this regime came into power the first time they have done public participation regardless of how shoddy it is is when there is a political question you know we have had the finance bill uh, this year we have had the finance bill last year i never saw any public participation but this year because they want to be very quick to to uh, to, to make it look as if it's the whole country that wants this impeach, impeachment. They brought public participation to the ground. But even if they brought the public participation to the ground, was it uh, done how it's supposed to be done? Were people given civic education on the question that they are being asked? Or they were just brought for forms on one day and told, tick this box or tick this box, or just write your other opinion, you know? So I have a problem with you asking for accountability uh, when the coin uh, is looking at you properly. Mm. Because if you are to ask Ask me if at all these people had 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 um, the Kenyan mind as we Kenyans people look at it, they would have come to the ground, given us civic education, told us, you know what, our government is not performing because our deputy president has done A, B, C, and D. Okay. Now, this is the civic education on the question we are going to raise. They give us time to analyze the question, to understand the question, then they can bring us the question. Okay. But not waking up one morning. And, and every member of parliament aligned to Kenya Kwanzaa is tweeting like, in two weeks' time, things are going to go down on Facebook, on Twitter, and everywhere else. Then on Sunday, we see them saying, in Sikuni Tuesday, Sikuni Tuesday. They are behaving the same way we as uh, Gen Z used to say, Squia Mandamano is a certain day. Yeah. So this political, this political issue has been given a key front in this nation. Yet, when it's our issues being discussed, I've told you, Trevor, yesterday the parliament was adjourned because quorum was not met. So you can imagine when there are bills that discuss about the Kenyan people, these parliamentarians are not going to show up. But when it's about Gashagwa, they'll be there throwing, throwing words left, right and center the whole day, calling who and who names and making it look as if the impeachment is going to uh, secure our airport. It's not going to secure our airport. Right. Is the impeachment going to help our economy? It's not going to help our economy. The buck stops with the president. Okay. Either works it out or not. Okay. And that video by Njere summarizes the voice and the stand of the bold in this the bold podcast in this impeachment process ladies and gentlemen if you look here kenyans have looked at this headline and i have seen uh, people commenting on this headline influencers both <laughs> aligned towards the deputy president getting a shagwa in the government side and i was so curious to look at what exactly is the details of that story and i can tell you without um, you out of doubt that what people are commenting people have not read that article i've taken time to go through that article ruto's call and failed attempts to save Geshagwa. So I want us to look at what exactly happened, what was inside William Ruto's call, and where these two failed attempts. Then I'll interpret for you why the DP 
was actually the president actually wanted the intrigues of that call for the DP to leave office. So just take some time. I promise you that this will be a very interesting uh, storytelling session as we explain what the nation is actually talking about. Now, and I think it will also paint a picture for you to understand what exactly is what the government is not telling you about that impeachment. On Monday, the 7th um, of October, the Deputy President Rigadi Geshagwa was seated in a close door meeting with some his close family members and lawyers preparing defense, um, the defense on the impeachment motion. At 10.45 a.m., the DP was informed that someone was on call on the line. And when he picked the call, it was none other than the President of Republic of Kenya, William Ruto. And of course, that call was very special because of two reasons. It is that time, the DP on Monday, that was on Monday, over the weekend, the DP had had attempts to reach out to the President, but they had failed. On number two, Rigali Oshik was facing that impeachment. And of course, one of the most interesting factors on that call here is Rigadi Geshagwa had not spoken with his boss for the last four months. The last time Rigadi spoke with Ruto was in JKIA when he went to see off president who was actually leaving the country heading to Italy to attend that summit of um, the Italy, uh, a, a summit in Italy over the peace in Ukraine and, uh, and Russia. And allegedly, uh, the story, um, uh, the, the article is saying that uh, since that last encounter, which also in JKA, it didn't well, it didn't end well because together was largely was 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 really humiliated. The DP had never talked to his boss one on one. The last time they spoke was in July. Now that tells you that uh, even if the son of Madeira will survive the impeachment. The government is very hostile for him and probably there is an isolation card already on table. So the communication had broken completely, uh, of course, for some reasons. And I think uh, it is that time that the president was told that the man that wanted him out was the deputy president wanted him out of government probably i think he was told that and he believed it um there's an article by there, there was a story by um th th there was a story by ken mijungo talking about how some ministers regarding spoke with some ministers so maybe that is where all things started now gachagwa is saying that that call lasted for seconds it, they didn't even speak for a minute and uh, according to what I see is it was one way. It was not a conversation between two people. It is someone who has called just to, to, to tell you this is this. And Geshago is saying that it came clear to him at the end of William Ruto's call that he was on his own. Because one of the things he would have expected, maybe would have expected a sign of reprieve from the president saying that uh, he's going to survive um, because the president had even said in the past when there was an attempt to impeach the president, uh, the president convened a meeting of uh, UDA leaders and told them to stop that impeachment process. So probably the delegate was expecting the same. But at the end of William Ruto's call, it came clear to him that he was on, on his own. Most definitely, Rigadi was asked to resign so that he can take his packs. The only two, the only two ways in it. Because what he received was not good news. He received bad news from the president. So at that time, what was expected? What are some of the things that were expected? That I'm speaking with the MPs and just they put, um, we are trying, finding a way to withdraw the bill. Or number two, 
is um, you know I want us to meet and have a conversation so that probably that doesn't happen or the lastly was that I will not, I'm not going to support you I don't know about that impeachment and if the best thing you can do is to leave I've seen many analysts looking at it and uh, I'm a bit more convinced and I want to tell you why I'm convinced that the DP asked, uh, that the president asked the deputy president to resign. Just allow me to um, put my point there. Um, this was then followed by emissaries who spoke about it. And, um, and I wanted to look at um, deputy president. When, you know, after that protocol, I think around... Um, some people are also saying that together they had not planned to make that um, uh, to make that uh, 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 address around 1 p.m. After the guy they realized that he was on his own and now had to choose make a decision either to resign or face the battle. There's one thing to it. He called the press briefing, the joint presser, at 7 p.m. 7:30 p.m. And look at how he laughed at the calls and those who are reaching to him, asking him to resign. He was so intentional. Meant to overturn the will of the people. Finally, in conclusion, I want to say that overturning the will of the people is not a joke. It calls for very serious violation of the Constitution. None of these issues here meet the threshold. We'll go to Bunga tomorrow. I'll be there at 5 for two hours, and I'll put my case. In the unfortunate event it proceeds to the Senate, I'll be there again to prove my innocence by way of evidence. When I called this press conference, there was a lot of speculation that Regard Gashagwa wants to resign. <laughs> this is a man elected by 7.2 million Kenyans. How dare you suggest to him that he can do so without public participation? no intention whatsoever to resign from this job. I'll fight to the end. I have tremendous respect for our judiciary and the professional judges of the High Court, the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court. And in the professional manner, they have handled serious issues affecting Kenya. And it could tell you that um, he was setting subjects. He laughed. He really laughed the issues, the fact of him being told to resign. Now let me pause a minute there. There, there were some few... I'm looking some cards. There, there were some expectations on the president asking DP to resign. Number one, I think um, uh, Ruto knows new Rigetigeshek and he knew that if he asks him to resign, probably he's not going to. And he will face the parliament. That will be it. But I can also, but, but, but on the other side, William Ruto did not foresee the impeachment, the level it has reached. And I'm very sure that the initial plan A, Brigadi kick-out motion, um, kick-out plan 101, was to ensure that we threaten, they push him to resign, not to go through impeachment. And, and, and let me tell you, do you remember... Um, Previous, just that was last week, huh? 
we were told 300 MPs have signed the motion to impeach the Gavi. Then we saw 281. And if you look at uh, the, the Kenya Kwanza bloggers, they were all running the propaganda stories in social media of Rigadi Geshagwa tourism. And, and even as late as after the parliament, there was a letter that surfaced online that allegedly the deputy president had resigned. And that was it because everyone knew very well that Rigadi would not take the risk because if he is impeached, then he is out of political equation, in Kenyan political equation for the next 10 years. So that will be the end of his politics. And, um, and to that end, the DP really, really wanted Rigadi out. And the reason why he also wanted Rigadi out here is it would have saved him the narrative that he's pushed to get it out. Remember, and, and let me let me look at this two, let me look at some two resignations. Do you remember Kinoti? Kinoti was forced to resign. Only later for the media to be told that he resigned voluntarily, to resign as the DCI. Only for the media later to be told he resigned voluntarily. Do you remember IG Kome? Aji Kome was also pushed to resign. But the media was later told that he resigned voluntarily. Now, what the script that William Ruto was playing was very clear. He would have, he would have, they would have wanted Rigedi to resign. Then they come and tell the country that Rigedi have resigned voluntarily. To that end, they will be able to manage the narrative around it because they can go and tell the Kenyan people that Rigedi have decided to run away from government and no one wanted to impeach him. I can tell you the uh, president will go on top of car and Mount Kenya and ask them, he would have asked those questions to the voters. Now, prayer. So that, that is what, that is that extent on that call. But I want us now to look at um, the two attempts, the attempts before even this call, because they also tie to why this call was made. Prior to this, Geshegwa had sent three peace emissaries to State House. This is what this article is saying. These three peace emissaries included Nyeri Archbishop Anthony Muheria, Anglican Archbishop Ole Sapit, Jackson Ole Sapit, and SDA leader Samson Nyaberi. Okay, Hussein Mohammed asked, he's saying he doesn't know about it. But these leaders met the president on Sunday. And in fact, before they met the president, it is believed that that public apology that Gadi Geshagwa issued on current church on Sunday morning was informed by this delegation. Because this delegation told him, we are going to the president, but we are taking the message of reconciliation. So I think even you, you need to take up that message of reconciliation. And these church leaders met the president on Sunday. And the president told them, uh, told the clerics about some of his issues, fights with the deputy. Even though Ruto promised another follow-up meeting, which that is confirming, they don't have information that it happened. And, and most probably it did happen. And I want to tell you a sign that it didn't happen. So Ruto told the church leaders that Trigadi had annoyed MPs with his abrasiveness. One. Number two, that Trigadi was fighting government projects and not publishing, publishing Mount Kenya projects being implemented in Mount Kenya. <laughs> Bueno, bueno, you know, okay, you know, Rigadi is not publi publicizing pro projects any government is doing in Mount Kenya. I think Rigadi is also a frequent visitor in Mount Kenya. But even these MPs, the members of parliament who come from UDA, they are never marketing the government projects in this country. So I find that charge a bit isolated. 
the chief whip Osoro. I've not seen a video clip of Osoro supporting, you know, supporting government agenda in the village huko. What they do is they call press conferences in Nairobi and only speak in parliament where they know that most of what they say sometimes doesn't even get to their voters. But when they attend funerals and burials and church services in their constituencies, even UDA MPs fear talking about government projects because most of them are actually failed policies. So that was the first attempt by the MPs and it did work. Then Mutai Kahiga also camped, uh, booked a hotel in one of the Nairobi hotels to meet with Mount Kenya MPs who were amongst the 291. Now the first attempt was the church leaders. The second one was by this one by Mutai Kahiga who met with Mount Kenya MPs in a city hotel especially the ones that had signed to impeach the deputy president but all that was in vain because the MPs did not show up. So the guy had to move. So it is believed that after, I think what changed the deputy president was what happened, was that Tutor's call. Because that Tutor's call left him with no option that you are alone. So you either fight it or fight it. After that church initiative failed, SDA leader, through their leader uh, Samson Nyaberi, through their lawyer Dunstan Omari, went to court. And, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, they went to court challenging the high court, or rather asking the high court to compel Chief Justice Martha Kome to constitute a bench of three to hear regarding impeachment case. And Justice Lawrence Mugambi this morning, this morning has granted the prayers by what the church, the church leaders, what the church leaders were asking in this video here. The good determination of whether the question of any law is inconsistent with or in contravention of this constitution. Number two, the question whether anything seems to be done under the effect of the constitution or any law is inconsistent with or in contravention of this constitution. Number three, any matter relating to constitutional powers of the state organs and respect of the government and any matter relating to constitutional relations between levels of government. And number four is a question that is in the conflict of laws under Article 91. The phrase substantial question of law is not defined in the Constitution. In the case of Harrison, in the river, as we were being canvassed by the parties advocates, on the issue of the constitutionality of standing orders, the respondents strongly oppose the contention that this amounts to substantial question of law because such issues have been litigated before, including constitutionality of standing by single judge and thus is not a novel question warranting the referral of this petition to the Chief Justice. I was however keen to pick out the unique challenges uh, pointed by the petitioners in assailing the standing orders that the National Assembly particularly relied on in carrying out the impeachment process. The petitioners will point out various concerns. The limited duration of seven days to carry out the entire process was cited as having an inhibiting effect on carrying out adequate and meaningful public participation. The failure by the standing orders to integrate or provide for any mechanism for public participation and or a framework to credibly authenticate the outcome of public participation process were some of the issues that the petition has raised as requiring serious circumspection considering fundamental position public participation occupies in providing continuous legitimacy to the actions of those charged with the exercise of delegated sovereign authority under the Constitution. Considering the immense public interest that this matter has generated, and being the first of its kind in Kenya where the Deputy President of the Republic is being removed by process of imprisonment, it is my considered opinion that this matter deserves the input of the bench so as to pronounce itself on the process that is constitutionally compliant to serve as a benchmark for future undertakings of this nature. It is necessary for this citizenry of this country to know whether the current state of law allows adequate opportunity to participate meaningfully in the process of removal of their deputy president. There was also the question of whether the allegation subject to an impeachment should be circulated to the public or or sorry, should be circulated to the public 
with or without the response of the person being impeached, and in the absence of including the response that if, if the, the question whether the current parliament is properly constituted and thus incapable of carrying out the impeachment process in the light of Supreme Court Advisory Opinion Number 2 of 2012 was also highlighted. The impeachment motion in the jurisdiction of the court and Act 165.3 extends to interrogating the material relied upon under Article 45 and Act 145 so as to determine if the operation to support the allegations was established either in the National Assembly or the Senate or both. Given the extensive nature of this proceeding, starting from the National Assembly all the way to the Senate and the massive public interest of the matters generated, it will require the mind of more than one judge to determine. In any case, despite the opposition by the respondents, it is my considered opinion that these petitions raise weighty constitutional questions that fall under Act 163, B and D2. Hence, I am persuaded to refer them to the Chief Justice for, and for empanelment of a bench. The lead petition shall be petition number E523 of 2024. The rest will be funded alongside this file to the Chief Justice and petition number E509 of 2024, E527 of 2024, E528 of 2024, E525 of 2024, E506 of 2024. So that is the decision. This um, petition was launched by SDA. After they tried to reconcile the president is definitely failed, they went to court. And if you ask me, I think SDA was just to launch, but that decision was made by those church leaders after they realized that things were going on. One thing, one thing, just a quick, a quick turn on this. In 2020, in 2022, the mainstream churches of SDA, Anglican, and uh, Catholic were not in the picture. The president campaigned using the evangelicals. Where are they? Where are those evangelical churches? Where are they? They are the ones that prayed and put these these two fellows in power. Where are they? Where are they? Where are they quiet? You know, why is it that their voices cannot be heard in this? I'm I'm really wondering. Now, um, members of parliament, it's also in part of this, what are this article is saying, that members of parliament have asked the president not to engage his deputy on any reconciliation since that ought to have been done before they start. I want to break this. I want to look at this now, um, that story. I want to interpret that story into two. The first bit, I want to explain the Monday call. First, why is root? Why is the Gandhi leaking that story now? Today is uh, call was on Monday. Today is Friday. He is leaking William Ruto's call. Uh, he's telling the media about it because from what if the nation is writing this, then it must have been leaked by someone who was in that meeting. And that person could I want to believe they are trusted Rigadi Geshagwa allies. It can only be leaked by Rigadi Geshagwa himself or one of his aides. Probably it serves the purpose to explain to the country. The guy is explaining to the country that he is alone in it. Yes. He's explaining to the country that it is him and him alone. And he's also explaining that he has opted for the court because William Ruto has closed the way on reconciliation. But clearly, from that call, there are some three messages out there that you can see. Ruto wanted Regadi out, and Ruto wants Regadi out. There is no shortcut about it. Ruto wants Regadi out. So it's upon Regadi to see the possibility of staying in. But I think his boss is clearly telling the country, I want you out. The second one is this issue of Regadi's statement that he was removed from the WhatsApp group where events and the diary of the president will be communicated is very true. Because from that, it's very clear that they have not spoken for the last four months. And lastly, Rigadi Geshek was Monday presser. Even though the MPs are condemning the president on it, are condemning Rigadi Geshek on it, but um, I think it was to respond to the president. 
The Gede was also responding directly to President Ruto on that matter because it happened after the president made that call. And, the, and, and I think it changed, and it changed a lot of, because on Monday the Gede was very reconciliatory. But when he realized that then it is what it is, he decided to go full blow. Now, let's interpret the issue of the two uh, of the attempts to reconcile the president and why it all failed, what we can see from it, what we can see from all that, and even looking at the allegations that William Ruth has raised against his deputy. There is this assertion that impeachment, this impeachment process is anchored on promoting national values and good governance. Kenyans must be very keen. If you follow this to the latter, you realize that that assertion is fake. The, move, the promoters of regarding impeachment are not honest that they are pushing national values and good governance. Yes, I know. And we, the country, is in agreement that there was no way the Gadi Geshawa could refer to this country as a company. There's no way. And the fact that he spoke about it in public could actually had and, 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 and even made this podcast, we called out the deputy president and we said the country cannot take that direction. But there is no way we can be talking of promoting national values by calling the shareholding remarks on the deputy president. But we don't want to question why in coalition building agreements which is also anchored on law, developments are being divided by the number of votes that 30% of bitumen roads to be built in Mount Kenya. We to be built in Western Kenya. We are also hypocritic as a country. Much as we call out the statements on shareholding, we are calling statements on uh, uh, the, state, the public utterances on shareholding, but the president was in Mount Kenya parading members of cabinet that has been picked from Moranga and telling them that I have given you treasury from here. I've taken, I've given you, I don't know, uh, Lance Water CS, Alice Wahome from here. Then, at some point, people even went and, and said, we are going to Luanyanza. I've given you Eli uh, Wallo uh, as the CS, so that represents Nyanza. So what exactly are we saying? As a country, we must also be truthful. And... Ruto is just using, is hiding behind that to settle grudges. And that brings me to the second point. The courts must be vigilant enough to see politics from this removal and argue on proof of violations. You know, Musa Mdavid is the shortest serving vice president. I believe he should not even be not even marvel at this impeachment. But one of the things in the 2010 constitution, why we embedded the deputy president and the president in one ticket, was to ensure, of course, some stability at the presidency. Was to ensure some stability at the presidency. And raise the bar of impeaching. You know, sometime... During the Moy day, during the Moy era, even Quebec era, the DP was being vice president was being picked and can be fired any time. I can tell you, if Rikedi Geshago was the days of vice president, he would have not been Kenya Kwanza even for two months. And the to Lewata Kitambu Sana, they would have just picked him after getting votes, they chase him and then bring in the Kidiki that they wanted. Now, so if you look at the impeachment, 80% is political trash. 80% of what is in that document is political trash. And so the court must do, should do a service to the country by providing a platform 
to sieve the politics aside. There's no way Martha Comer is going to listen to the president not talking to the deputy for the last four months. Those are, those are corporate issues. That's a political trash. There is no way the courts are going to listen to MPs shouting Monday to evening about I was called Malaya. No. Hmm? What we want is the violation. And is the violation binding? Thirdly, the MPs were charged against DP, but the decision by Ruto to take silence was just to hide behind parliament, but he's the face of it. I think it should also worry the church that despite of them making an attempt to save the situation, their voices have been declined. Thank you.